Hello and welcome to part two of Skullface, the nuke that wasn't there. I'm Jordan Lee. We'll pick back up with CK Land right around September 11th or so. That is September 11th, 1944. On this day, American troops crossed the German border for the first time. And the day after, Romania signs an armistice with the Soviet Union, essentially changing sides in the war, where they're promised a restoration of the pre-1940 borders. And therefore, reobtain possession of Transylvania, the place of Skullface's birth. You too have known loss, and that loss torments you still. You hope hatred might someday replace the pain, but it never goes away. It makes a man hideous inside and out. Wouldn't you agree? (laughs) We both are demons. Goldface tells us two slightly different origin stories. We have to assume that we're meant to stick together. My village had an oilseed field, and a fine factory. I was born in a small village. I was still a child when we were raided by soldiers. Foreign soldiers. In the first one, he tells us about what happened to his small village in the mountains of northern Transylvania. Second, he mentions what happens to him afterwards. The first story is noteworthy for its ambiguity. This has to do with the madness of the World War II era, particularly for smaller peoples and powers dominated by big brothers. People like the CKs. To quickly remind you, first the Treaty of Trianon, Paris Peace Conference, and its byproduct, the League of Nations, all led to this region falling out of Hungarian hands and into Romania's at the end of the First World War. You better look now. Best to understand your situation sooner than later. I know it's difficult, but please look down. It's best to see with your own eyes. Be brave. No, Sakoma! Grigor! Try to calm down! Calm down! Please! Calm down! It's gonna be okay! Yes, yes! Calm down. Yes. Yes. Then, the Nazis reversed this in 1940 with the so-called Second Vienna Award, only for the entire region to get consumed by the fires of the war, then occupied and reoccupied again by Germans and Russians over and over again. All this means that, simply, we can't say for sure who Skullface's village made weapons for in secret, as he tells us, to fight their current occupiers, but most likely it was for the Nazis to fight the Soviets. Or the Hungarians as the Nazis' proxies to fight the Soviets, if we're being specific. <laughs> 
The specter of holy war. The Nazis mobilized during the war to stir up Eastern Europeans against Russia. Both Christians and Muslims were called upon by the Third Reich to join forces with Hitler and drive the Soviets and their so-called Jewish communism to annihilation. Maybe it was the Soviets, maybe it was the Romanians, but whoever it was retaliated on the village in Skullface's case by committing a tacit strike on CK's identity. The factory in the village specialized in processing rapeseed oil, a bountiful natural resource evidently to the region. In this regard, attacking the factory to burn alive everyone inside is somewhat similar to how Allied bombers targeted Japan's wood-based architecture with firebombing, or how the cities of Hamburg or Dresden were unspeakably savaged by hellfire, the likes of which only the atom bombs or the Holocaust can compare. Whether wiping everyone out in the village by destroying the factory was an intent or simply a side effect, Dullface, I'm getting at, didn't wind up by the end a very big fan of the Allies or their victory. And given that the two main allies, the Soviet Union and the United States, would soon be divvying up the world into East and West, it makes sense that Skullface won't be much of a fan of that Cold War's New World Order either. Yet irony of ironies, it is the allies themselves who dig Skullface out of the rubble and decide to save him. Well, save is not really the right word. It's more like they did to him what the Patriots will later do to Gray Fox for him to become Cyborg Ninja. In other words, they snatched his body, brought him back from the brink of death to make him into yet another one of their beautiful monsters. Skullface has finally burned out. The world is rid of his existence at last. Was he still alive? You could say that. But you could also say he'd been dead for decades. What's that supposed to mean? Biologically speaking, it's hard to say how much was his life. Side effects from the treatment? No. The primary effect. Keeping a dying host alive as long as possible. That is the whole point. But in the end, he grew too dependent on his children. Hmm. As if he had any other way to keep on living. He first underwent parasite therapy before the Soviet Union became his home. His body was horribly burned. Fire washed across his thin young frame and stole his skin and his throat, even his lungs. Only through repeated therapies could the parasites keep him alive. Most of his life became something the parasites gave to him. And then he lost the ability to die. That is correct. The parasites live on past the host's death, still aiding cell composition. At that stage, there is no way to extract them from the host cells. There is no way of knowing when the last cell of Skullface's body would die. The only choice was to burn the whole thing. And his children, along with it. The philosophers, the patriots, as the eons roll by, the story remains the same. The only parasite-enhanced test subjects that we know of at this time in the Metal Gear timeline are in the Cobra unit, led by the boss. Now, how exactly the philosophers managed to weaponize or specialize strains of parasite, it's a bit of a mystery. But it seems to correspond with a related experiment, which we'll cover in greater detail in a later episode in this series, called the ethnic cleanser parasites. In effect, the idea here seems to be that the philosophers were trying to corner the market on using secret science to make revolutions. No different in this regard than the Manhattan Project. Many different latent strains must have been discovered and weaponized based on what we see in the Phantom Pain. But they could not yet be mass-produced or reverse-engineered as of the 1940s. That's why one such discovery, inside a cadaver discovered by the Chinese philosophers, preserved perfectly in a permafrost region, would lay dormant until the formation of Zero's outfit, Cypher, and the beginning of their era of information, that is to say, genetic control. 
but it seems Skullface was revived using another parasite. It would be the similar or same one that Code Talker evidently uses to extend his life. Miller will be given to to stay alive, and Quiet will be given to to replace her lungs and skin. Although, we really can't say for sure if these are the same parasites or similar parasites or what. That's just the nature of the ambiguity of this game. Why was Skullface, though, given this treatment back in the 40s? Well, out of usefulness. A ghost without a past, a man without a face. Well, he can become anyone precisely because he is no one. Skullface's horrifying countenance means also that he can only operate, only live, dwelling in the dark. Someone like that, someone so horrifying to look at that no one would even believe you if you told them you really saw, is perfect for the new age that the end of the war brings, the Cold War, and its so-called delicate balance of terror. Don't worry, I kept my word. She didn't suffer long. Skullface was revived by the Soviet branch of philosophers, presumably, just as his homeland, Transylvania, reverted the possession of Romania becoming a Soviet satellite state. People like Skullface must have felt somewhat like Winston Smith in Orwell's 1984, published 1949, being forced to believe that two and two can make five, or one, or sometimes three. First they had been CKs, then Hungarian, and then Romanian, and now simply Eastern European part of the Iron Curtain. Keep in mind that this new mapping of the world geographically severed the CKs from fellow Hungarian speakers, surrounded on all sides as they now were by Romanians. It seems Skullface was forced to become an operational covert asset for the Soviet Union in their new post-war job of policing and, well, dominating Eastern Europe. This part is somewhat unclear, but apparently Skullface was at the same time using other parasites to secretly wipe out Soviets and Romanians, particularly ones responsible for his homeland's misfortune. Even Stalin, it's implied, might have felt Skullface's wrath by the end. This Soviet spy hunt rocked the counter-intel world. Mysterious fatal illnesses, accidental deaths, drownings, people having strokes behind closed doors. Just like Stalin, no one knew who was behind it. But all you need to do was look for who had the motive. They were all taken out by a man without a face. And now we've got an idea of how he did it too. We'll talk much more about Skullface's plan and what happened once he eventually joined the United States and the CIA under Major Zero. But for this entry, I wanted to talk a little bit more one last time about the sea case. And in particular, from 1952 to 1960, the Hungarian Autonomous Region. Something's vitally crucial about Hungary's relationship throughout the war with its would-be ethnic enemy and rival, Romania. Because both sides held within their borders members of the other's population, both respective minority groups were miraculously protected. How? Well, via a mutual policy of deterrence through the specter, the phantom, of retribution. This will of course play a major role in Skullface's eventual plan in the Phantom Pain. No words will be needed. Every man will be forced to recognize his neighbor. People will swallow their pain. They will link lost hands. The world will become one. But first, he was brought back to life, right around 1944 or 45. In a direct prelude to similar transformations, we'll see with coming Metal Gear characters like Gray Fox, aka Cyborg Ninja. Skullface, given his origins in such a remote place that, politically speaking, after the war no longer exists, makes for the ideal candidate for this project which revives him via implanting life-sustaining dermadromic parasites. These parasites will rob Skullface not only of his face, but his epidermis, presumably burned off in the fire. 
that outer layer of visible skin that marks him human. And more, the parasites will rob him of a way to ever fully die of natural causes, and crucially, to ever physically feel anything again. According to Ocelot, it was following this horrific treatment that Skullface, who could not have been older than 10 by 1950, became a kind of shadow child soldier for the Soviet Union. Skullface came of age using his powers as a kind of living memory hole or haven outside the system's reach for his own dark ends. Skullface, in effect, became a living weapon. He set his sights on members of the original Soviet occupying force who first converted his homeland of northern Transylvania into a Romanian communist region. The reason he got away with these reprisals may have been due to our consistent theme of there existing no facts, only interpretations. The Soviets dogmatically tended to interpret the world according to so-called class consciousness and class warfare. They could only see the threat of Western capitalism for the most part, and so all other threats became seen in that context alone. Skullface, however, was not some American mole, killing in the name of capitalism. His retaliation was in the name of everything Stalinism and Russian communism was against, namely borders and nationalism. This unique clash between internationalism on the one hand and nationalism on the other in the region would give way to crucial events for Skullface's people, the CKs. One, the formation of a so-called Hungarian Autonomous Region in 1952, and two, its dissolution and the start in Romania of an era called, roughly, National Bolshevism in 1960. We're talking, in other words, really, about the unresolved conflict inherent to the doctrine in whatever form of international communism and class warfare. To the hardcore traditional communist, bourgeois nationalism refers to the alleged true interpretation, whereby divisions and borders are merely ways for ruling classes to preempt and co-opt class warfare. In this mindset, national identities and mentalities are mere fictions, disguising what to communism is in fact a nearly universal breakdown of power structures between the owners and the workers. To the hardcore Marxist, the doctrine of class consciousness entails that all proletarians think alike, while all bourgeois think alike, that they're all extensions of the same basic mind. The problem here, obviously, is how communism treats the Industrial Revolution as its year zero, totally thereby ignoring the salience of eons of cultural conflict and the importance for context of things like time and place. The one-size-fits-all ideology of communism arguably blinded its rulers from acknowledging the simple fact that, particularly in places like Central or Eastern Europe, identities were not so easy to break down and build back up again as something different were not so easily disentangled, either. The idea that Soviet citizens and satellites would ever give up the ghosts of their pasts, unite, link lost hands, and reunite beyond national borders to become fellow comrades in a global class struggle to take back from the capitalist owners the means of production, well, simply put, that was a fantasy. In CK land, the new Soviet masters enforced the fourth ever so-called Stalinist five-year plan, Orwell's 1984 drew its 2 plus 2 equals 5 conceit from the original five-year plans in the late 20s and throughout the 1930s, which were usually carried out alongside slogans to complete the five years of progress in just four. And the idea being here, propagandistically, that together the Soviets would work to make two and two five. What was the five-year plan model? Well, fittingly, for a series named Metal Gear, industrialization. Forced enlightenment of the agrarian countryside and peasantry through so-called collectivization, which broke the local and regional spheres down to rebuild them as better integrated within the wider collective, and almost always at the former's expense. It was for all this that when the Soviets forced collectivization on the CKs, essentially making their farmers labor not for the subsistence of the local populace, but for the entire country of Romania, the Soviets simply saw it as taking away the illegitimate power of private ownership in the pre-existing capitalist framework. 
To the sea case, however, this class dimension paled in comparison to what they largely saw as the real injustice that they, the national minority but local majority, the sea case, were now being forced to provide not for themselves, but parasitically for the Romanians and under threat of persecution and even destruction. This ethnic conflict was not totally lost on one man, Joseph Stalin. Stalin's blessing in 1952 provided the CK what seemed to be a momentary respite from oppression by forming the Hungarian Autonomous Region. But it was all to be short-lived, as Romania, in a transformation towards so-called National Bolshevism, by 1960 would end the HAR and brutally enforce a new kind of ideology that was communist in form, yet nationalist in its particulars. No less a confounding chimera, perhaps, than the Cuban one, which melded together Marxism with Catholicism. Ironically, for a society predicated on the abolition of monopolies, colonialism, and private ownership, after the Second World War, the Soviet Union gained the world's recognition as the sole rightful possessor of Eastern Europe. The question for the new Russian Empire then was how to rule, and how to retroactively justify that rule according to the very same Marxist ideology that had formerly called for an end to human bondage, class-based hierarchies, and empires. It would be an egalitarian society, but as George Orwell famously quipped in his novel Animal Farm, some among the equals would be more equal than others. As the Stalinist society paradigm began to spread in the form of mental copies, little Stalins and Stalin grads across the former Austro-Hungarian Empire and former Third Reich, the prevailing paradigm was to define nationality by ethnicity and to separate ethnicities into their corresponding so-called rightful place. Population transfers and agreements to this effect had been taking place between East and West since before the Second World War. By placating and indulging nationalists, Stalin reasoned, the illusory doublethink could take root that diversity is really unity, not unlike a similar dichotomy to be found in, say, the political framework of the United States or the UN. In political science, a shared division of power like this at the local and national level has been called federalism. Stalin wanted at least the illusion of federalistic shared power in the USSR, and really did conceive of himself not as the mere unilateral power behind the scenes, but given how much he would obsessively read letters coming in from all over the country, Stalin saw himself arguably as an extension, as much as a primary agent, of the will of the workers and the Soviet one-party state. I'm big boss, and you are too. No, he's the two of us together. Stalinism had been forged as an ideology like steel from the fires of the great terrors and purges in between both world wars. But those had been largely internal to Russia and its civil war. Now, Stalinism has already entered its third and final chapter, evolving to become a kind of cohesive force, uniting the entire East European region behind it, not in spite of, but if Stalin's will is to be carried out because of the inner fault lines and grudges, the inherent contradictions and mutual exclusives. A harmonious superorganism is made up not of a group of homogeneous individuals, but of diverse individuals that complement each other. That is what I saw in your group here. But Stalin dies in 1953. And there's no doubt a major crisis for the entire Soviet system will present itself in micro form in the CK land. That crisis, as subtly hinted and foretold by Orwell's 1984, itself written between 1945 to 48, was unilateralism versus internationalism, or the individual versus the collective. These themes, of course, will be seriously important for the Phantom Pain. The relationship between the two can only express itself in almost biological terms. Either the individual and the collective coexist in relative equilibrium, or one parasitizes off the other. And in practice, the latter only ever seems to be the case. A tyranny of the majority. What benefited the Soviet bloc collectively as propaganda harmed the Romanians as an individual ethnic group. They certainly weren't fans of the Hungarian Autonomous Region, especially since, it should be said, Romanians were being persecuted there just as much as Hungarians were being persecuted outside of it. 
The tension here set the stage for the rise, eventually, of Romanian National Bolshevism, a hybrid communistic nationalism that would put the Romanian culture, history, and people first among equals. Because of the size and linguistic complexity of this new Russian sphere of influence, soon to be called the Iron Curtain or the Eastern Bloc, what the Soviets really needed was translators and interpreters. Skullface's unique position as a former CK in a version of Hungary that by war's end, as I said, no longer existed, made him the ideal candidate for the philosopher's experiments, given he became literally a ghost without a past. So Skullface's original jobs for the philosophers, presumably the Soviet philosophers, involved, going on what he tells us, the very subject that he would later become so fixated with, language and language control. Skullface likely worked as some kind of interpreter. As the case of the HAR in Romania conveys, Stalinism by its final stages had become all about making sure the concepts driving society appeared the same in each mind in that society about maintaining the identity of the individual while they willingly make up part of the collective whole. Yes, I'm suggesting Stalinism bore strong ancestral resemblance to the Patriots and their eventual system that we see in the game of information control. In fact, there's traces there also to be found in the Third Reich, whose entire project of the Holocaust, at the end of the day, the long, dark day, was really about information control, uniting the people as the Nazis construed the people around a common, if phantom, enemy. In their case, the terror of a fictitious ethnic conspiracy against them of a minority and its purported conspiracy of global domination. In a way, it is some bizarre variation of the age-old imperial principle here to divide and rule. Bantu ya buta, ti ya mbele, ke tinkaka mosi, beto nyoso, ke bampangi, atampidina, we see dividing and ruling playing out over and over again, of course, all throughout world history. By maintaining social categories in the public mind, like race or nationality, rulers arguably prevent a Tower of Babel rising against them. The idea is that as long as such groups are fighting each other and such divisions exist, the ruling system and ideology from the Fox-like US or the XOF-like SU appear necessary to keep everything going. The blazing state of exception and emergency so necessary to the birth of 20th century revolutions from Germany to Russia to even the American military industrial complex, we find those fires in constant need of rekindling. So it's not in spite of, but rather because of internal differences and antagonisms that out of the many super emerges one, the cure for its own self-exacerbated illness. Two key words here are revanchism and irredentism. A revanchist is someone who, well, as the French root of the word implies, wants revenge, but in a political or national sense. And then irredentists seek to reunite or return something, whether people or territory, or perhaps even prestige. Both would become crucial words in the wake of the Cold War, as yet again the tumult of an empire's death spasms would again throw Eastern and Central Europe into disarray, and like buried bodies in a flood, all the age-old enmities and ethnic grudges would be dredged up again from the deep. I can't help but here introducing the concept of the literal case of phantom pain. Like the amputee's body cannot sever so easily its lingering traces of the memory of its missing limb, as Marcus Comprobost writes in Irredentism in European Politics, quote, Whereas state borders are usually more or less unambiguously demarcated, national boundaries are imaginations about the spatial limits of the nation, imaginations which appear to the nation as very real." End quote. Like in the human mind and its dual mind-body maps which explain the phenomena of phantom pain, just because the state's borders gets redrawn does not always entail a similar shift in terms of the related ideal of the nation's body in question. Skullface's plan, which I'd argue derives from his life experiences, but also a close and careful read of European and world history, 
involves making every nationality on Earth an irredentist, then depriving them in equality of their revenge. In this way, so clearly modeled on the mutual antagonisms between Romania and Hungary, and how those hatreds during the war ironically protected both as minority groups in each other's borders, Skullface intends to liberate the human race from what he calls the pain of ages of our own treading upon by words, particularly those imposed from on high. After all, the Hungarian language and CK society became basically emblems, weaponized ciphers in the Soviet and Romanian information wars. The only real distinction or privilege afforded in the HAR had been surface level, an apparent respect and preservation of local culture in name only. In the HAR, public signs read in both Romanian and Hungarian, public court hearings, administrative meetings, and culture were all allowed a Hungarian dimension and tongue and therefore face. But this little Hungary was just another Potkumen village from back during the Tsarist age of Catherine the Great. It was, in other words, a ruse, like the sort of false tanks and phantom units deployed to confuse the Axis by the Allies, which we may see a nod to, by the way, on the Soviet base camp in MGS-5 during Hellbound. At any rate, in Romania's case, that ruse really only benefited or corresponded with Stalinist Soviet interpretations and political ideology. By 1968, the bilingual duo-cultural nature of Romania's HAR under Stalin had long given way to a more nationalistic, Romanianized map. The CK's usefulness as Soviet propaganda diminished severely as a result of the failed Hungarian uprising of 1956, itself a chain reaction to Stalin's death in 1953, and the attempted de-totalitarianizing that followed. Now the Romanian nationalists were free to have their revenge on Transylvania for those years of mutual hatred and persecution. The autonomy and cultural boundaries of the CKs, you see, were never really protected by the Soviets nor respected by the Romanians. They were merely used to strengthen the mental foothold of their own oppressors by selling the world the fantasy of a multi-ethnic international union of socialist republics. Bullface will see a direct resemblance between this phase of the Soviet Union, arguably, and the late 20th century, the globalization phase of the United States. This gets Skullface thinking how to deliver the long-standing empty promise of a global order where boundaries and borders and diversity are all really cherished and safeguarded. And we'll see how he will plan to do that in the next entry. Skullface isn't specific on this point, but it's clear that helping maintain the Eastern Empire meant learning a host of different tongues and seeing the same underlying dynamic play out again and again enslaving minorities to the words and the will of the majority, while that majority is itself secretly steered and suggested into action by what is, behind the drapery, a different kind of minority, the ruling elite. And above any elite, or any human, for that matter, is the true tyranny that Skullface identifies, the tyranny of words themselves, our true lord and masters. It is not only, in other words, Soviet nature, but human nature, of which Skullface's many undisclosed assignments bring him knowledge. The ideal of the HAR, meanwhile, would become an empty marketing scheme, and the revenge-driven will of Romanian nationalism would override any sort of equality to dictate a very explicit hierarchy of master and servant, angel and demon, over Skullface's former homeland, Transylvania. Time and time again, Skullface watches as a new language and ideology is forced onto new peoples. How the entire Cold War derives from worsening, then parasitizing off of pre-existing latent ethnic or cultural conflict, often conflict expressed in linguistic terms. Like machines built with direct and singular purpose, the peoples of the world during the Cold War became easy to steer, easy to trick by distracting, easy to engineer, maybe to some degree, they always were easy to fool. But by the point the era of deterrence with the Cuban Missile Crisis became the age of detente in the 1970s, the paradigm shifts from maintaining the East-West balance through threats of nuclear annihilation to proxy wars fought parasitically by exploiting those latent fault lines over which the whole post-war world revolves. The idea of the Phantom Pain is that it's Skullface who influences the shift in world events into the 1980s from detente 
into the final decade of the East-West competition a phantasmic reprise, the so-called Second Cold War. It will be the huge buildup by both sides of nuclear weapons that, after the Cold War, will give rise to the era of borderless and boundless nuclear proliferation. And in the Metal Gear universe, as we'll see in Part 3, all of this went according to plan. Until next time, boss. <laughs>